I'd like to everyone, I'd like to welcome everyone to the fifth and final event of Experiences Canada Reconciliation Conversation. This event is focused on education and economic prosperity within and by Indigenous leaders. My name is Jonathan Plank. I am one of seven reconciliation ambassadors that Experiences Canada has hired to help facilitate these conversations and those on our discussion group. I'm a settler Canadian from Treaty 4 territory in Saskatchewan and I will be the host of this conversation where we will be talking about the work of reconciliation and the importance of education and economic justice. Before we begin, I would like to thank the RBC Foundation for being our sponsor for this event and their support in fostering conversations to help inspire future leaders of Canada. Our leaders today will discuss the truth of education for Indigenous youth and how they succeed within those parameters, as well as we're beginning our discussion with Manitoba's own Grand Chief, who has been a pillar to both his community and those across the whole province. Both their work in education and economics has brought many great things to their community and peers. Thus, why they're here today to discuss the subject matter of today's forum. Reminder, this is webinar is intended for youth 12 through 18 with a specific interest in teachers or educators wanting to incorporate more lessons on reconciliation. Recordings of our conversation today will be available later this week with minor revisions to ensure the flow of discussion with French sub subtitles for Francophone Canadians. Each speaker will be given the opportunity to speak to you directly. Then we'll move into a question and answer session at the end of each speaker's address. So we want to hear from you. If you are connecting with us via Zoom, please type your questions into the Q&A box. And if you are on Facebook Live, please comment on the live stream. We will try and get as many questions as possible to ensure everyone's voices are captured. If we do not have time, we will be sending the questions to the speaker after the webinar. We'll be posting answers in our conversation group and website. So please make sure to connect with us. First up, we have Grand Chief of Manitoba, Manitoba, Arlen Dumas, a graduate of Mount Allison University, where he studied political science. He was elected in 2017 to serve as Grand Chief after nearly a decade of serving his home community of Paktawa, First Nations. He has worked to improve infrastructure for Indigenous communities and improve their ability to participate, throughout, participate in the global economy throughout his tenure. We are so excited to have you here with us today, Grand Chief Arlen Dumas. Hi, good morning. I want to uh, bring greetings uh, to everyone on behalf of uh, all the chiefs in Manitoba from all of our communities. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, part of our discussions today. I want to thank uh, the Experiences Canada for, for the opportunity. I want to uh, first uh, uh, acknowledge the songs that we heard op opening our, our webcast today. It was, it was good to hear those songs. I want to uh, acknowledge Autumn LaRose Smith. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of you. It was good to meet you. I know we only spoke very briefly, but I believe that you are uh, an ambassador. You are a role model and you are an excellent example uh, and, and precedent setter for, for everyone uh, in, our, in our community. So I wanna, I wanna thank you and acknowledge you. Um, I guess uh, just to, I just want to share a couple of stories with everybody. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, and uh, you know my experience uh, education. You know, uh, like the great Chief Dan George said, has been one of the greatest implements ever afforded to me uh, in 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 all respects. Um, it's been very valuable in it, uh, and has helped me uh, throughout my life in different ways. So I was born and raised uh, in Puckettawag in Manitoba, which is a remote and isolated community. It's about 850 kilometers north uh, west of Winnipeg. We're very close to the Saskatchewan border. Uh, so, uh, you know, provincial boundaries aren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, indicative of who we are and where we come from. So I have a, a lot of relatives in Saskatchewan and a lot of relatives in Alberta as well. Uh, um, Cree, uh, Mississippi, the Niwak, where people of the Mississippi River, which goes from uh, 
uh, northern Alberta, northern BC, northern Alberta, into Manitoba and into the Churchill River. Um, I was raised on a trap line. My grandfather was a, was a, a trapper. I learned that way of life. Uh, it was very important to, to learn those skills and learn, learn everything about, you know, running a trap line, setting, setting traps and, you know, all, all of those types of things. But as well, my grandfather was uh, uh, one of my, the main advocates for my own personal education. He ensured that I, I learned how to read. Um, I don't know where it came from, but my, the, the, the book that I remember him reading a lot to me was uh, um, uh, Alice in Wonderland. And, uh, you know, he, he ensured that we, that, that I read, he made sure that uh, uh, he, he, he shared the importance of reading to me. So then uh, uh, when I left the trap line, I, I went to school on the reserve. Uh, you know, the school, the school uh, was very important to me. I had some very good teachers, uh, you know, starting school, kindergarten, you know, we had a, a, a Bella Sinclair, she was our, was our kindergarten teacher grade one and grade two. Uh, we used to need translators because my first language is Cree. And uh, so I was getting instruction in both languages. But um, unfortunately, by the time I was in grade three, um, we didn't need a translator anymore. And that the emphasis on speaking English was, was uh, impressed upon us in, in different ways. Um, sometimes uh, not very not very polite ways. And then that had, had an impact and an effect on, on my education as I moved forward. You know, the, the, the focus on just uh, speaking English all the time. Um, and then that had, a, that had an effect on the, on the younger, younger generations. And then from, so, uh, so I said that the school had electricity, but in, in a very peculiar way, our homes didn't have electricity, you know, uh, um, we had to we had to haul water. We had we didn't have electricity. Those those ones that had electricity would share an extension cord to so that you at least have a light uh, in your in your home. Uh, and uh, you know, so it was, it was quite different. And uh, and I'm not talking about a hundred years ago, right? I'm talking within my my lifetime. And uh, surprisingly, my home community did not have access to regular electricity until 1986. Um, so if you could appreciate that in, in your own lives, think about that, you know, until you're, until you're about 15 years old, you actually don't have proper, proper uh, utilities like running water and electricity. Uh, so think about how that would affect you in your, in your education and, and, and how you would move forward. Uh, fortunately, you know, things were happening, uh, uh, nationally in, in Manitoba here, I'm going to commend, you know, the Wabung chiefs, you know, the, the, the great leadership that has come. So many initiatives and precedents started in Manitoba in regards to local control of education and wanting to sort of uh, direct how, how these services would be received in our communities with an emphasis on reflecting who we are and, and our languages and our people. And mind you, as I was going through the system, it was in its infancy. Uh, however, I'm a testament to those initiatives and I wanna commend and thank those leaders for uh, helping fashion my education and the experiences that I had because I'm, I'm a, I'm, I benefit from, from that advocacy that had happened during that time. Uh, but there was a series of things that had happened. So um, at, at 15 years old, due to the circumstance, I actually had to leave my home community, uh, and that was just how it was. You know, uh, at the time in my in my community, you only went up to grade 10. So then you get shipped away, you get sent away from your family, your support group, and you go uh, off. So um, I was fortunate to get a, a scholarship and a bursary to end, attend school in Ontario. So I went to a school called Lakefield College. Uh, um, it was uh, quite a unique place. It was quite a unique opportunity. But with that said, it also brought forward a, a whole other different type of uh, culture shock and, and different experience. Uh, fortunately, there were some, some very good people that, that helped me along the way. Great support groups, great, great people that, that helped, uh, you know, helped me deal with, you know, issues. Um, uh, 
like discrimination, racism, you know, there's, there's, there's things that sort of impact our community, ignorance, you know, uh, however, you know, it was my, it was my personal foundation, the conviction that I had and, and who I was and what I could do that, that helped move me forward and, and not, not allow uh, anything to distract me from, from what my goal was. Um, so, you know, from there, I went to uh, Mount Allison University. Um, and then uh, I finished uh, school at Mount A, became a father, and then that sort of shifted me in a different direction. I returned home. Um, I always felt a sense of obligation to, to go home. I always felt a sense of obligation to, to go back and give back to my community for, for uh, the opportunities and, and privileges that, that being from my home community provided to me. And I'm eternally grateful for those, those elders and all those people that, that helped support me and encouraged me not to give up and not to, not to uh, be distracted from, from some of the difficulties and struggles we have. And some of them were just on a personal on a personal level, right? Like I went from having growing up in a community that was very very closely connected, that was very supportive, uh, and then essentially being shipped shipped off all by myself. Um, ideally, I wanted to go uh, at the time. The, the places to come were were Winnipeg or the town of the Paw or Thompson, and I wanted to come to Winnipeg because a lot of my friends were coming to Winnipeg. But my mom uh, said. You're going to school something where you're where where you're going. So then I, I listened to my mom because I'm a good boy, and I got sent off to uh, to go to school in Ontario. Uh, so then it, it, that created a unique uh, experiences and and different ways of getting me through. And I'm grateful to to, to all the people that uh, that helped me um, persevere and and uh, get the education that I that I had received. Um, but education is multifaceted. You know, there's different experiences. I, I find that some of the uh, initial things that I had learned at a very, my foundational years, you know, the importance of learning how to read, the importance of learning, you know, uh, keeping track of your, your, your trap line, keeping track of your, you know, all those things played a very, very, very important role in, in allowing me to be a successful in, in all of my education as I move forward. And uh, it's, it's very important to acknowledge that. Uh, but it's also very, very important to acknowledge the, the, the differences that we all have. You know, some of you may have, uh, have had the benefit of having electricity all your lives. And, uh, you know, the benefit of uh, uh, turning on a tap so that you could wash your face in the morning. Um, you know, not having to run down to the lake and uh, punch a hole in ice and Run, run the pails up so that the rest of the family could warm water so that they could wash their faces in the morning. You know, and all these things sort of play a role and, and they are reality. And unfortunately, uh, in this day and age in 2020, some of our, some of our families in, in Northern Manitoba still have to haul water. You know, they don't have running water. They don't have, they don't have access to, to much needed services that, that some of us take for granted. And, and we need to advocate on be, behalf of that. Um, so I alluded earlier to, to the work of an advocacy of, of, uh, of our chiefs and our, our community members. And I referenced a, 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 a book called Wabung. And I encourage all of you to sort of look and, and look for that document. It was done in, in the 50s. It's 51 years old today, this book. And uh, it was done by our chiefs and our advocates back in the day. And that book actually outlines and made a plan as to how we needed to move forward collectively in this country, in our region, uh, so that we would we could all sort of benefit and, and move forward in a constructive way. And it's uh, quite remarkable. And it's those types of things that sort of sent a precedent for me that allowed me to move forward in the way that I've been able to move forward. So when we want to talk about reconciliation, to, to talk about that in, in a meaningful way, we need to draw attention to the issues um, that have, a, that have uh, facilitated the need for reconciliation. You know, to those of you, wherever you are, uh, I encourage you to sort of uh, uh, take a look a little bit more and, and explore uh, why things are and, and trying to figure out a, the reason as to why um, there are difficulties and having a pr tr true appreciation of that, you know. So when I reference earlier in my statements about how I grew up, you know, this is, 
this is relatively recently, you know, not, it's not 150 years ago in pioneer days. Like this was, this was in 1980, 1982, you know, and, uh, and the impact that that would have had on, on my worldview and my, my outlook and, and uh, the obstacles that I had to overcome in order to, to do and achieve what, what it is I was able to achieve. So going back to the, to the advocacy of our communities and our, and our chiefs and the willingness to, to try and move forward in a progressive way and, and trying to um, find solutions and, and create opportunities for everybody, I want to sort of draw our attention to the, to the initiatives. Some of the, the first precedent setting educational systems uh, came from Manitoba, from the work of the, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, as it was called back in the day. Uh, it's called the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, which we are now called the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. Um, but it was the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood that, that endeavored to find solutions and, and create uh, um, different opportunities for, for all of us. And uh, it created um, uh, the Man so those, those things led to the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center, which fundamentally is a is a to be a center of excellence that is to go out and find you know the latest in in curriculum development to to go out and find new innovative resourcing and and uh, education educating material uh but through those initiatives it's also become you know developing a school system developing curriculum it's a it's turned into a multitude of different things but first and foremost it needs to uh work towards enhancing and, and uh, uh, creating innovative ways and recognizing the sovereignty of our individual nations to, to educate in the way that they, they want to educate. Uh, and I, again, I look at myself personally, you know, my grandfather insisted that I, that I learned about the land and I learned how to look out for myself that I, that I could at any given moment, I, I you know, if, if I'm plopped out in, in the middle of nowhere, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'd be able to make a fire and build a shelter and, and ensure that I look out for myself, but I would also be able to to read about, you know, uh, the Wabam chiefs in 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 the in the uh, documents that the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood have written. So it is building a, a mix and and doing things in in in, in innovative ways in order to uh, draw attention to it. And then in in regards to reconciliation, again, you know. These are these are the realities that our that our indigenous people, our First Nations people, face every day. There are obstacles. Uh, everyone thinks that they're sort of a, a universal realities that that we all accept. That the fact that we can switch on a light in, in the morning, uh, the fact that we can turn on a, a, a tap to give us water, you know, the to, to that we have a, a heat uh, through our through electricity. Um, that's actually not a reality in, in some of our families to this day. And uh, we need to draw attention to those things and figure out how, how we come forward and, and continue to advocate and, and work with our allies to, to create a better, better tomorrow for, for everyone. Um, so um, I want to acknowledge all those people who have who've dialed in today, uh, uh, endeavoring to, to learn more, uh, to get a better understanding, uh, to to uh, help everybody work towards reconciliation and and build a a better tomorrow for everyone. And uh, so with that, I'll say Igosani, Chimi, which Kinanasko Mitnawa, Masicho, and Wapida. Igosi, thank you. Thank you, Grand Chief. Uh, at this time. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A section of the Zoom call or on the Facebook Live comments. So, uh, here's a question that we pre-read. Um, how do we create spaces for reconciliation to help bridge economic and educational gaps between Indigenous Canadians and settler Canadians? I think first and foremost is people need to be willing to listen and, 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 and ask questions. It's more important to ask questions. Oftentimes, and I don't mean to get political, but oftentimes solutions come from someone else who's thought of something without actually asking uh, First Nations people uh, what it is we want to do. You know, I acknowledged Wabung earlier in my comments, and because of the 
the paths that were laid forward. Never before have we had the level of expertise, you know, that we have doctors and lawyers and, and accountants and education experts and all of these people. Uh, and we, have, we are more than capable of, of bringing forward solutions and you just need to ask and be willing to listen, right? Oftentimes people hear what you're saying, but they don't listen to you. And then uh, when they do that, it, it causes difficulty. Thank you, Grand Chief. Um, education for Indigenous youth has been stained by the history of residential schools. What has been your experience with education throughout your life? What would you say to those Indigenous youth who hear about the realities today, with, both within the secondary and post-secondary system, and are afraid to try? I would encourage them to, to try as hard as they can. I would, I would, I would draw to the attention to the fact that despite all the difficulties we've experienced, uh, and the, despite the the, the uh, systemic issues that have literally interfered uh, with with our education, with with our development, with our with our with our, our betterment, that we still persevere, and the the fact that we're able to to sit here together in 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 a, in a meaningful way is is a testament to that legacy, and that we need to honor that legacy. We need to honor and 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 make our our lives better. And uh, and I know that it's difficult. I know that it, it's very hard. And I would encourage all the young people that um, it, it's important that when you're in your emotional difficulty to try and think clearly and uh, pause for a minute and realize that things will get better. But you need to make it get better. You have to use that personal conviction that you have inside of you to overcome whatever gets thrown in your path and you need to succeed and you will because you're an amazing person and you can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, an another question here. What are some things you would like to see happen now to help build a better future for youth in your communities and how can reconciliation help with that? I think we need to keep building on the successes we have. You know, I think we need to keep building on those on those positive experiences and the positive things we have. And we 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 need not to to dwell on the past. We need to remember the past. We need to appreciate the reason why things are the way they are. But they do not define us. We define what, how we move forward and what we're going to do. And we have to be willing to educate everybody around us because, unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance. You know, I remember uh, throughout my my education experience, people would say completely ignorant things and they wouldn't even realize how offensive they were. They wouldn't realize uh, uh, arguably how racist they were being, but you, you have to be willing to educate those people. And sometimes you have to educate people harshly and, and correct them because if we enable, you know, that ignorance, then, then all of us lose. So to those young people that, that uh, experience those things, you, you need to be persistent and we need to be willing to, to learn and we, we need to uh, keep moving forward. Thank you. An another question here. Yes. How can we better integrate Indigenous communities into the global economy so that they can become full, full members of affecting change across the globe? So it's, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, um, first of all, you need to, do, you need to realize that the, the institutions of this country have legally, legislatively uh, in, uh, disallowed for First Nations participation in, in the economy in, in a variety of ways for a long, long time. And even up until today, there's actually a lot of limiting factors that, that try and uh, in, attempt to interfere with how First Nations participate in the economy. And uh, despite that, we have glowing examples all across the country of people doing really innovative and progressive things uh, in different ways. We have First Nations that own railway companies. We have First Nations that own airlines. We have First Nations that own construction companies. We have First Nations that own uh, uh, all types of different businesses across the country. We have some First Nations, you know, our relatives up to the north who own uh, hydroelectric installations. We have people who own wind farms and solar farms. We have all these people and, and they've been able to succeed by not allowing other people to interfere. And sometimes that takes 
political advocacy, it takes advocacy from our, our community members. And in all those cases, we have uh, uh, people who have benefited tremendously through, through land claims, through, through developing infrastructure, through developing different resources. And the cool thing is that when First Nations do well, everybody else does well, you know? And, and there's ex going examples of that. When, when, our, when our businesses do well, it's not only First Nations that benefit, it's also our allies and our relatives and everybody that's attached to, the, to those businesses that, that do well. So, um, and in order to have reconciliation, again, it goes with, with what I was saying about education. People just need to listen. You know, there's actually growing examples. We've done stuff with across the country uh, in, in different regions, but predominantly in Manitoba, we've done innovative things with, with forestry companies. We've done innovative things building our own railway companies in, in collaboration with the province and the federal government. We've done innovative things with, with, uh, with, um, with uh, you know, different things in, in the province. Uh, can you share some examples of how the education system is now self-governing in indigenous communities across Canada? Well, there's different different iterations. We, we need to be mindful of, of, of um, how our governance works, you know, and, 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 and it's different region to region. You know, in, in Manitoba, and uh, uh, our, our nations, our, our, our communities, our nations, they are, they are the authority, right? Our chiefs and councils. And then, and then they, they decide what it is they wanna do, and then it moves uh up towards me so by the so i'm directed by my chiefs i'm directed by my chiefs and councils they they mandate the different things that they want us to do to advocate regionally or or individually uh so um so depending on what it is that that we've been mandated to do at the assembly uh the 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 governance structure is is completely directed by our community some communities cho choose to be part of a, a provincial school system, some choose to be part of a, a First Nation school system, some choose to be independent and, they, and they, they themselves individually decide how they want to move forward. And then, you know, regionally, there's, there's sort of a veil of, of, of uh, advocacy that, that all of our communities rely upon at the assembly. And essentially the communities decide how, how, they, how they want to move forward. Um, the arm's length relationship that we have with the Manitoba First Nations Resource uh, Center is, is just one example where, where uh, you know, our, our communities decide how they, they want to look after their educational system, and then we support them on, on, on how, they, how they do that. So in a nutshell, that's, that's sort of like a, a loose uh, definition of, of how our First Nations control and direct how their educational systems work. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Grand Chief. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Autumn LaRose Smith. Uh, please feel free to enjoy the, stay around and enjoy the rest of the presentation. And we'll forward any questions that come in throughout the length of the event onto you and your team. Absolutely. Thank you again. No, thank you. Uh, so next we have Autumn LaRose Smith a proud queer Métis student at the University of Saskatchewan, who recently became the first Indigenous woman to be elected president of the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. As an active volunteer within her community, she sits on the board of Nest Creek Cultural and Recreational Society, participated in the We Matter Ambassadors of Hope program from 2019 to 2020, and participated in multiple school clubs at the U of S. Her activism, both within the education system and outside, has created a strong Métis woman for Indigenous youth across the country to look to for success within the post-secondary education. Welcome, Autumn. We are so pleased to have you here with us today. Awesome. Hello. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And, and thank you to uh, Experience Canada for inviting me and to uh, Chief Island Dumas for your very kind words. Um, yeah, that, um, where do I start? Um, I was asked to provide uh, a, a cheat sheet um, and kind of tips for uh, your success as, as a youth. And I think that's quite funny um, for someone who's, who's still considered a youth and, and still learning very much. Um, I know that there's not one way to do things. So I'm just going to share um, things that I've done and things that 
um, when I'm working with youth in the community or even working with um, uh, first year students on our campus, things that I share um, that I think are really, really important. Um, and first I want to note that um, throughout this entire process, um, I experienced a lot of imposter syndrome um, and continue to fight that every day, even, even being on this talk uh, today feels a little bit funny, but um, it's reminding myself that um, still there's a lot of room to grow, but um, it's okay to be, be, proud of, be proud of myself. Um, so I guess um, things that I wanted to share were just about uh, and as, as cliche as it's going to sound is um, just being open to your journey and, and what that process looks like. Um, for me, when I graduated high school, um, I have to say that I wasn't the best um, student in, in my classes. Um, I never really had high marks. In fact, I actually hate school um, so much, but something that um, even in university, something that um, has kept me um, going back to universities knowing that um, there's my, my friends and my, my community that I can um, hang out with in different student groups and volunteer with. And so um, just putting yourself out there to uh, try those new things and just getting involved or um, for those students who are going back to, or for those people in this chat who are going to be joining university this year and, and recognizing that um, for most people, it's going to be um, in an online um, format is just trying to figure out which way um, how you can get involved with um, other students in whatever way possible because it'll be it can be very isolating to do this alone um, so um, another thing that I want to share is just um, asking questions um, even when you think you know the answer um, but you're unsure asking questions because it might be something completely different from what you're thinking um, and for me that's just I I feel like um, that's how I've learned um, throughout my process is always having a hand raised in class um, that probably comes with always needing to talk and um, in talking to my friends and I would get away um, if I really needed to, was feeling jittery and needed to talk I would just ask a question to the teacher um, and, and learn something um, new every single time even when um, I felt like I, I knew the answer it, it's also very humbling to to get reminded that sometimes you don't know all of the answers. Um, and then just, yeah, trying new things. It's okay that, um, for me, I remember in, in grade four, I was so convinced that I wanted to be a geologist. I wrote a letter to um, Potash Corp um, and they ended up surprising, surprising me in my classroom with um, a rock collection of rocks that they've gathered all throughout the world. And then by the time grade five came, I didn't want to be a geologist at all. And I still have my rocks today, but um, just knowing that things are going to change every single day. Um, even right now, I'm, st I'm only 23, so some days I wake up and I completely envision a new life path for me, and then um, the next day I'm like, ah, actually, no, that was a, that was a spur of the moment decision. I, I, I want to do something completely different. Um, so just knowing that it's, it's okay to kind of feel, feel lost in the process, but know that ultimately you're going to um, end up where you end up where you're meant to be and and end up really loving um, and, and loving that and so just um, wanting to like remind people that um, if they're feeling especially now um, in a time when I think so many of us are feeling uh, lost and isolated is just knowing that those feelings are okay and that there's um, community in that as well um, and that a lot of people um, can share similar experiences with you and, it, and, and reaching, being mindful um, and remembering when you, um, that you can reach out um, and just accepting that sometimes um, you're, that's going to happen and, um, but you'll get through it and you'll find, you'll find something that you um, absolutely enjoy. Um, like I said, for me, I, I hate school. Um, I'm in my fourth year of university and I probably have um, about two years left. And so um, it's, taking, it's taken me a lot longer than um, those who, who go in and they get their, their degree with four, four years and, and um, sometimes never look back. And, but um, for me, um, it's been a huge focus to uh, be a part of, as, be a part of my, the student groups that I've been in. Um, I'm in SUNTEP, 
So that's a uh, Saskatchewan Urban Native Teachers Education Program. Um, and I, it's a Métis focused um, education program with the um, Gabriel Dumont Institute um, and the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan. And um, through that, I've um, learned so much about uh, my culture, um, made amazing friends and, and just really was able to build a community um, and really felt um, empowered to, um, to be a part of our, our student council and to, to venture out and to be a part of different um, student groups. And there was a time, I think, in my second or third year where um, I ended up leaving my job. I went tree planting and I lived in a tent for three months and um, decided that I wasn't going to come back to SunTap. Um, this wasn't the program for me um, and I wanted to do something else. And, and when fall started, when September had started in that first fall term, um, I remember I was in Petland and it was two weeks into the term and I was like, oh my gosh, I made, I made a mistake and called the, the director of my program and was like, can you like, are you able to take me back? And, and she kind of laughed and she said to, um, that she never even took me off the um, registration. And so I was able to come back to university. And so I'm just wanting to remind um, the folks on in this chat and on Facebook Live that um, it's not linear. Um, you're going to venture off, um, of course, and, and maybe you're going to come back and maybe it's going to take a lot longer than um, just a summer or just a couple weeks um, like it did for me. And, and even today, I still sometimes I um, uh, go on my courseworks on my program and see what it, how many classes I need left to go into a completely separate degree and then get reminded that, no, this is, this is where I want to be. And um, um, just um, being uh, okay with feeling like um, almost like a feeling like a sense of sense of loss in that, um, but knowing fully that this is what I love and this is um, and I'm so proud to be in in my program and that I just I feel like that's my ADHD brain is I, I see I see shiny things and then I'm like oh that program looks really great. Um, so just, yeah, wanting to share that. I, um, I also wanted to share um, like how important with everyone for me, volunteering. My, my mom instilled um, the importance of volunteering in me and in my family at a very, very young age. And I've been able to experience much more than I could ever, um, that I could ever imagine. Um, I grew up, with a, my mom's a single, single parent in a single parent home and she had five kids. Yes, I see someone say SunTap is amazing. Um, yeah, my mom had uh, five children and she worked full time to support us. Um, and I am so grateful for how hard she's worked and, and able to um, drop me off at, um, I was part of the leadership and training group um, at the YMCA and different, different things that I wanted to be a part of in the community because she knew that um, that was really important for me and, and in my development. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And I want to share to everyone else um, that um, how, how um, important it is and, and for you to be able to get out um, and something, and it, and it doesn't have to be um, the uh, cliche uh, volunteer experience of what, what you may be imagining. Um, if you're an artist and you um, love to paint or you love to draw and figuring out different ways that you can share that with your community and you can, and you can, open up your experiences to everyone else and open up their experiences as well. And, and, you know, maybe that means um, volunteering in a, in a senior's home and, and, you know, saying that you want to bring, you want to bring your paint supplies and, and bring those paints and then being up, being open um, to learning all those different experiences. Or um, if you want to be a part of a community organization, you can say, Hey, I'll make your posters for this event because um, I, I love art and, and recognizing that, um, your passion and your skill is a gift that um, that you can that you can share with people. Um, same, um, or if you um, love to write um, and you want to be able to um, write letters or, or um, uh, help out a different organization in that way. Um, just just wanted to share that uh, there's no there's no one way to be involved with things with with things in your community. Whatever they have going on, there's always a place for you um, if you ask. Um, there's always going to be a place for you. And, and if there's not, then um, figuring out who you can ask to, to, make that, to make that place and take up that space. 
Um, so I think that's really, really important, especially for young minds. Uh, something that I, I, I've seen um, floating around is in regards to mentorship um, and finding a mentor, but how important it is for for youth to be mentors as well to, to older generations. And um, there's a lot that older generations can learn from youth um, and, a, and a lot that youth can, can learn from older generations. And so having that, um, building that relationship and that partner, that partnership is really important. Um, because even though uh, for me, I'm 23 years old and I know that um, my, within my experiences, there's a lot for me to share. Um, but I have learned so much from um, youth and, and, and children who are 13 years old or younger, and they've taught me um, brand new perspectives on life and, um, and new skills and, and new, way to do, new ways to do things. So just reminding yourself of, of that, of your value and, and um, reminding yourself to, um, that it's okay to like, take that space. Thank you, I think. Um, maybe we can, is now a good time for the questions? <laughs> Thank you, Autumn. Uh, we appreciate you talking about the success of students and how we can help them grow. Uh, we have one question here. That, uh, from your experience as a vice president of student affairs and now as president of the student union, what are the biggest challenges still found within post-secondary institutions that need to be addressed for indigenous youth? Thank you so much. Um, so in my actually first couple weeks in my, of my term as Vice President Student Affairs, um, I was able to take a look at um, the policies and bylaws that our organization had. And, and something that we, um, we have a, um, at what it was once called the Indigenous Affairs Committee. Um, and so that was where the Students Union would work with the Indigenous students on our campus. Um, and something that I was, um, it, we were able to change and that was it, able to be voted through was changing it from Indigenous Affairs, um, something that uh, a historically problematic term and um, comes from a very parental um, um, uh, lens um, to the Indigenous Advisory uh, Committee. So acknowledging that um, it's the Indigenous students who are advising us um, and they're sharing their experiences and their knowledge um, and, and putting um, the Indigenous student um, president uh, council president as the co-chair of that committee. Um, so centering their voices, um, acknowledging that um, that we need to to give them space to give Indigenous uh, students um, the space and and really uh, listen to what they what they're sharing um, and acknowledging that their experiences and, and their knowledge are um, uh, knowledge is, is just as valuable. Um, and so I think when you consider university is, uh, you know, it's a system that was put in place to, um, to get rid of, uh, to, to contribute to the, um, to the continuous genocide in, of Indigenous people, um, Indigenous women, and, and to um, uh, end of that culture. And so acknowledging that for a, lo for a lot of Indigenous people, going to university is, is um, leaving a potentially um, their their safe space and going into somewhere into somewhere that was meant um, to get rid of them, and so I think moving forward with university and 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 in terms of reconciliation, there's a lot that we need to do in terms of decolonization and and um, acknowledging um, and through that acknowledging our our history and acknowledging um, that um, there's just a lot of work to be done. Um, I think Ireland Dumas spoke in regards to residential schools and um, and here in Saskatchewan, the last residential school closed down in 1996, um, but our College of Education um, was, um, opened in 1939. So there's uh, 30, 30 years there where, where teachers from our university um, received their College of Education, received their education degree, education degree um, and then most likely moved on to work in those schools. And so acknowledging that there's a lot of change to be done and how we can address um, curriculum, how we can address um, policies with the university, and how we can address um, policies with the provincial and federal, federal government to support those students. Thank you, Autumn. Uh, one more question. How do, how do settler Canadians engage and support reconciliation, reconciliation efforts? Uh, I, uh, yeah. um, 
I believe that when First Nations people thrive, Canada thrives, as the Grand Chief stated. It is difficult to know how to engage in a culturally appropriate way. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I can speak to experience um, um, when I used to be on our SunTEP student council and we would host um, events um, on our campus, different uh, Métis cultural events on our campus. Something that we noticed um, was that there was always only Métis students going to them, um, even when we said that they that they were open to other students. And, and through asking my uh, non-Métis, non-First Nations friends um, on our campus, we don't have any, uh, I think, I don't think we have any Inuit students um, that I know of on our campus. And But through asking um, non-Indigenous students who who really wanted to be a part of it, but um, were scared of potentially taking up that space or um, or or doing something wrong and 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 potentially causing more harm is um, the importance of them of reminding themselves to be humble and that it's a learning experience. Um, for myself, I'm um, re relearning my Métis culture. Um, uh, through my SunTEP program. And so there's a lot, even for me, there's a lot for me um, to learn when I go to uh, different, different cultural events or, or ceremonial events um, that I'm taking in is just um, being mindful of, of my space. Um, if, if this is an event or an initiative for Indigenous um, students or Indigenous people to share their experiences, um, and you're a non-Indigenous person, being mindful that um, when you when you're talking in those spaces, you're, you're taking up space and, and um, away from somebody who, who could share, um, share with you and, and, and teach you. So just being um, really mindful and, and um, of the space that you're taking, but being, um, being humble and reminding yourself that um, it's a learning process. And if your heart's in the right place, um, then uh, there's not going, there's, um, um, then you should be you should be able to be comfortable um, in apologizing for when you're wrong, um, um, but also um, for just accepting um, that it's a process and, and um, being kind to yourself as well. And um, I think it's really really important for um, um, if we're going to move towards efforts of reconciliation, reminding um, that it's a learning process for everyone um, and that through community, um, we can, that, I think that's how we're going to be successful in that. Thank you, Autumn, that's really touching. Um, we'd like to invite Grand Chief Arlen Dumas back to speak on the forum, which will be happening next year in Manito in Winnipeg. Okay, all right. Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Autumn. Uh, I just wanna echo something very important that Autumn said about learning from the youth. I, I, I want to express to all the youth, I want to share something very significant. I was at a rally last Friday in Winnipeg. Uh, it was, it was uh, drawing attention to a lot of issues that we're dealing with in regards to policing and systemic racism and all those things. And there was thousands of people. And the thing that stuck out to me the most was how young people were. There was young people there. There was young First Nations people. There was young black people. There was young uh, uh, non-native people, all kinds of people, thousands of them, our, our allies and our and our and our nave and our uh, our friends, and I want to thank all of those people because all those people gave me hope and it showed me that and I would I would argue that there those those young people that were out on that field their grandparents most likely wouldn't have come to that event, arguably I'd say their parents would have had difficulty attending that event but those thousands of kids those thousands of youth those thousands of young people that showed up to that rally taught me that there's hope and that they're going to fix everything for us so we just need to listen to them and with that said uh because of covid because of covid 19 and 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 the pandemic we were to have a, a gathering this summer but it's been postponed so I want to welcome each and every one of you to Winnipeg next summer in 2021 for the Experiences Canada uh, gathering. And I, I hope that each and every one of you are, are able to come and, sh and uh, come and visit us and, and share your experiences. And in closing, I want to show all the teachers out there the book Wabung. This was the 40th anniversary of it, but I said it's over 50 years old now. And I think they've done a new copy. 
But this is the document that was drafted by our chiefs over 50 years ago that actually uh, wrote out a blueprint for all of us to follow. So, you know, to all the educators out there, the students, university students in college, when you're wanting to do a paper, take a look at this. So, Ibasani, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grand Chief. Uh, and I'd like to thank all our, our uh, viewers. Experience Canada and Staff and Reconciliation Ambassadors, I would like to thank all panelists and participants for helping make the Reconciliation Conversation series a success. We'd like to see these conversations continue in the future and so that we can create a better Canada for all. The work of reconciliation is going to be a long road with many bumps. Hopefully you'll be able to take the ideas discussed in this series and continue to discuss them and let them grow to affect real change in your community. To our speakers today, Grand Chief Arlen Dumas and Autumn LaRose Smith, we thank you for sharing your stories and insights and thoughts. Our last webinar is bittersweet. Our last, our last webinar is bittersweet, but one we're sure to see more from you as both as we continue to grow your message and inspire more Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth towards the right path of reconciliation within the education and economic opportunities. I would like to encourage all youth to participate and sign up for the in-person youth forum on reconciliation to be held next year, found on the forum section of the Experiences Canada website. Reconciliation Canada and Experiences Canada will staff will continue the dialogue on education and economic opportunities on our discussion and group on Facebook. We have planned discussion topics directly related to what we heard here today. A weekly challenge encouraging folks to research and share their knowledge of Indigenous leaders or businesses they admire. Educational resources and a lesson plan. Be sure to check, out, check them out and spread them widely. I would like to extend our gratitude to the RBC Foundation for sponsoring these events. Without their generosity, these events wouldn't be possible. And for that, we thank you. Please take a moment to share your feedback about this event and complete the survey link you will be receiving after we close this call. Thank you for everyone. Thank you everyone for your time and goodbye.